OK. So thank you um, all for coming tonight. And uh, and turning out for the 12th work group meeting for the potential historic overlay district for Holmes Run Acres. Uh, my name is Denise Dressel. Uh, for those of you who are, aren't familiar with me, um, I'm the principal uh, heritage resource planner with the Department of Planning and Development. And with me is uh, Lily Yagazu, who she's not on camper, but but she is here. And um, she is the principal um, uh, planner in the zoning administrative administration division, excuse me. Um, Grace Davenport is also with me. She's heritage resource planner with the Department of Planning and Development. And Sarah Vonish has joined us. She is from EH Traceries. They are the consultant that is uh, doing all of the design guidelines for um, the historic overlay districts across the county. And Sarah has been working um, with Homes Run Acres uh, throughout this process um, and is here to talk tonight about the uh, second draft of the um, design guide. It's good. Sarah's nodding her head. It is the second draft, though. <laughs> um, and, and as I said, I am I go blind when I share my screen. I can't see anything. So if you all have questions, if there are hands raised, uh, Grace is going to let me know. Um, just interrupt me and say, you know, there's a question because I won't be able to see um, anything as I share my screen. So with that said, I'm going to share my screen and we'll uh, get started with a quick presentation. Um, and now I have too many things open. There we go. OK. Uh, so the community had asked me to um, give a brief overview of historic overlay districts, um, the study process, uh, the ARB um, and the ARB review process. And I'm, I'm going to do this quickly because uh, this is repeated material for most of the work group members. Um, please visit the uh, the studies website, the it, the uh, Homes Run Acres HOD study web page. And I think if you just Google Homes Run Acres Historic Overlay District, it'll get you there. And there's um, a ton of information on our web page of uh, this is our 12th meeting with the work group. So um, I think there's a community meeting on there as well. So there's a there's plenty of information and all of these uh, meetings have been recorded. So if you would like to, you can go back and watch the recordings. Um, I know to get up to speed, I, I did that and it was very insightful. So I um, encourage you to do that if you're uh, trying to catch up with, with what the work group has, has been done and where the study is. So um, quickly again, uh, Historic Overlay District, um, they are um, officially designated by the Board of Supervisors to promote general welfare through the identification, preservation, and enhancement of those buildings, structures, neighborhoods, landscapes, places, and areas that have historic, cultural, architectural, or, or archaeological significance. They prevent encroachment of new buildings or structures and additions um, that are architecturally incongruous, incongruous with the visual and historic character of the district. They promote an uh, uh, up, upkeep and rehabilitation of older structures, educate residents and encourage preservation and ensure that new development within the district is appropriate. So at the um, direction of the Board of Supervisors in January 2020, county staff um, are conducting a study that will prepare a report with recommendations. This will include, but is not limited to, um, analysis of and recommendations on the historic and architectural significance of the district, analysis of current conditions, description of individual structures, present trends and desirable objectives for preservation, descriptions of existing structures, and um, a determination of whether they contribute to the historic character of the district, identification of uses likely to have an adverse effect on the desired character and descriptions and justifications of the boundaries. What a potential historic overlay district designation could need for your property. Um, 
it does not historic does it, historic overlay districts do not apply to interior alterations existing renovations and modifications to your um, your homes can remain the underlying zoning which is r3 will remain in place but what it will mean is that um, architectural review review board approval would be required for before a building permit can be issued for exterior renovations construction or demolition So uh, what is the Architectural Review Board? They are a regulatory authority that reviews actions on properties in the historic overlay districts. The purpose is to administer provisions of the HOD to assist the Board of Supervisors in its efforts to preserve and protect historic architectural and archaeological resources of the county. They are a group of 11 professionals in the historic preservation field that include historians, architects, lawyers, landscape architects, and archaeologists appointed by the Board of Supervisors. The ARB reviews and is responsible for uh, approval of building permits, sign permits, and demolition permits for rehabilitation, new construction, and exterior alterations requiring a building permit in HODs. The ARB makes recommendations on zoning actions such as rezonings, special exceptions, and site plans in the HOD. It advises owners of historic properties uh, on uh, historic properties on preservation, and it meets monthly. When is a building permit required? And this is just a partial list. Please visit the Land Development Services webpage for a complete list. And you can see um, here uh, building permits are required for things like new buildings, additions, and uh, new structures, porches and decks. Um, just read the list. The, uh, the things that building permits are not required for are uh, things like fences, residential window replacements, door replacements, gutters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, while things like window replacements aren't regulated within the zoning ordinance, there will be recommendations in the design guidelines for for some of these items. So staff has put together this um, decision tree uh, of when um, uh, you may need to come to the architectural review board for your uh, project. I'm going to start from left to right um, and starting with the left column the or starting with the, the middle uh, question is your house a historic contributing or non contributing property to the potential uh, historic well of course, uh, homes run acres HOD. So if you start on the left if your house is determined historic or contributing the next question that you ask is does your project require a building permit as determined by land development services if the answer is no no building permit is required the no arb review is required if the answer is yes then the question is is the project entirely interior so for instance a kitchen remodel if the answer is yes then there's no arb required a arb review required excuse me if the answer is no, that there will be some exterior work anticipated, then you consult with the ARB administrator. That would be me, and um, I'll put you on the agenda for the ARB, the next meeting that's available. If um, your house, going back up to the middle section, if your house is uh, non-contributing, the first question is, is your house visible from a historic or contributing property? For homes run acres, every if your house is not contributing, it will be visible from a contributing property. Um, there's just no way around it. Uh, the houses are too close together, and um, and so the the answer will always be yes. The house will be visible from a contributing property. So the next question is, um, does your project require a building permit as determined by Land Development Services? And if the answer is no, 
then no ARB review will be required. If the answer is yes, uh, the next question is, is the project entirely interior? And if the answer is yes, then there's no ARB review required. If the answer is no, that some exterior work is anticipated, then you consult with the ARB administrator. And there are two administratively approved, uh, um, two, two projects that can be administratively approved that require building permits. So the Department of Planning and Development um, Heritage Resource staff can review and approve building permits on the ARB's behalf in the following circumstances for re-roofing, re-siting of non-contributing buildings or structures when the replacement roofing or siding is similar in color, material, and texture to that of what is being replaced, or for signs previously approved by the ARB as part of a larger property-wide sign plan. So I'm going to pause here just for a second and just check in and see if there are any questions yet. I do have one question. Yeah. Um, siding it only requires a permit for non-residential res residential structures such as Woodburn Elementary. Mm -hmm. uh, there be any review at all of siding in a in a house. So that would be a question for land development services. Um, uh, you know, I'm not. Ours is, uh, we have historic review. I don't, I'm sorry, I'm going to go, sorry, didn't, didn't realize my camera was off. Um, that would be a question for land development services. And I can follow up with that and get you an answer to that. But I, I don't have the answer. That would be, that's an LDS question. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Grace to you. OK, great, thanks. All right, I'm going to continue sharing. There we go. Catch up with my, my screen here. Uh, the de design guidelines. So as part of the establishment of the overlay district, it's necessary for to develop design guidelines. The guidelines will enable the architectural review board to effectively review and make recommendations on any proposed development or land disturbance within the potential historic overlay district if it's adopted. The Architectural Review Board will use the design guidelines when reviewing proposals for exterior renovations, new additions, or new structures, new construction, which require a building permit. Please keep in mind that the guidelines are not prescriptive. Rather, they are meant to help homeowners, architects, and builders, and the ARB determine how best to manage the changes that are going to inevitably occur as people live in their homes so that the character of the district is maintained. The work group received the second draft of the design guidelines uh, last fall of last year. I think it was late November, December. Uh, Sarah Vonish with EH Traceries has been working to update the design guidelines in response to the comments received. Um, also, please keep in mind that the zoning ordinance requires that the air be developed uh, and adopt design guidelines which follow preservation standards and best practices. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Sarah now at this point, um, but I, I will continue to operate the slideshow. Okay, thanks, Denise. Um, so this is the same draft that we reviewed together during the December workgroup meeting. Um, I haven't is issued an updated draft at this point. We did receive some comments from work group members and, and members of the general public, um, so thank you for those. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Denise. Uh, so I thought today um, we would just go through some of the, the comments that we received. Um, and if, if any work group members have additional comments they want to raise in the meeting or want to email us after, just um, that's fine. Please send them our way. 
Um, but the comments that we received on this draft uh, involved the schools, parks and landscape features, the roofing materials, driveways, um, the photo, some photographs in the document, and there are some miscellaneous additional. And I'll go through these in the next couple slides. So Denise, you can go to the next one. All right, schools, park, and parks, and landscape. Um, a commenter noted the location of Luria Park and Woodburn Elementary within the bounds of the HOD and um, potentially having historic significance. I'll uh, let. Denise talk about contributing status, but um, the commenter did note that the design guidelines should recommend their retention and maintenance and improvement. Um, so the, the current guidelines do recognize that Luria Park is a, a primary and significant landscape feature within the neighborhood. Um, it beyond uh, general landscape guidance for um, private property, we didn't talk about the park uh, specifically, so I'm proposing to add something in the design guidelines just uh, targeted directly to the park for its uh, retention as an open and um, open landscape for active and passive recreation. Um, and I don't know if I can address the second comment about special exemptions or special permits, but maybe we can talk about that at the end uh, once I get through the slides. Um, Denise, you can go through to the next one. So roofs, color and material. I think we've we've talked about this a bit in the past. Um, so just as a reminder, the ARB uses the, uh, they have review standards. They use the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation as a basis for their review of projects. Um, the commenter, commenter noted that um, the specific language and reference to roof materials and new roof penetrations um, needed to be addressed. So let me just go through and, and read them. Um, they noted that inserting new ro roof penetrations such as dormer windows should be removed. Um, in this case, in, in home run, homes run acres, we don't have any dormer windows, so adding dormer windows to a roof would not be in keeping with the character of the HOD. Um, but in their comment, they did note um, there wasn't any recommendations related to. Uh, sorry, I'm just realizing my slide wasn't fully updated <laughs> um, to uh, skylights. Um, and we had previously added guidance saying that skylights were not recommended on highly visible roof slope. So we can also add in the recommended section that um, low prof low profile. Uh, Skylights and solar panels may be acceptable on secondary or, or non visible roof slopes. Um, it's just where it's highly visible uh, from a primary facade where it would impact the character of the home. Um, and as far as roof materials, uh, we've we've talked about this in the past. The guidelines do note um, some not recommended materials, um, at emphasizing that new roofing should be compatible with the existing buildings and, and the character of the district. Um, so this may just uh, be a, a reminder to you all that um, based on the standards, the new uh, materials, while they don't necessarily have to match the materials where they are not, where you can't replicate the materials, they need to match the historic and design color, texture, and other visual qualities um, and materials where possible. Thank you, Denise. Yeah, you can go to the next one. Um, and just here's here are the design guidelines um, where we know that if replacement in kind is not feasible, uh, which I understand is is the case um, for some of the gravel clad roof um, materials, then a compatible substitute may be considered if it is um, if it replicates the appearance appearance of the original. And next slide. Um, and here's a reminder of, uh, so those were the guidelines for existing, the preservation and rehabilitation of existing roofs. And here are, uh, here's some guidance about new additions and new constructions um, that note that uh, roofing materials should be compatible again with the historic character and the existing roof. Next slide. 
Okay, so driveways. We received a comment about, um, I'll just read, the original driveways in the district, district were poured concrete. This bullet from page 78 does not conform with retaining the integrity to the district's period of significance. Pave driveways with concrete as done originally or use compatible materials such as peat gravel or permeable pavers. If use of compatible materials such as peat gravel or permeable pavers is considered retaining the integrity to the district's period of significance. All right, I don't think this copied correctly, but um, I think the commenter was noting that the, the guidelines currently recommend using concrete or an, a compatible alternative like um, pea gravel or permeable pavers um, when, in fact, originally all the, the driveways would have been concrete. Um, so we're going to revise those guidelines to clarify. Um, I did want to note that while existing concrete driveways should be um, repaired and retained or replaced in kind with concrete, um, there is clearly a need in the neighborhood for expanding driveways um, and adding parking pads in some cases. In these instances, an alternative material such as permeable pavers or um, gravel uh, might be the preferred option to reduce their impact in the landscape. So um, we'll clarify that in the design guidelines so that it's uh, so that that's clear. Thank you. Next slide. OK, so um, I received some comments about the photographs and having uh, contradictory uh, guidance, I guess. Um, so many of the photos and as you know, many of the homes in in the neighborhood have undergone alterations and um, all alterations may not um, meet the guidelines as we are drafting them today. It doesn't mean you have to return your home to any uh, previous condition or rectify those situations, but um, some of the, the photos where we're illustrating a recommended treatment or feature um, may also show a not recommended treatment or feature. So when you are looking at the document or looking at the photos, um, and I have a photo on the left as an example, as a photograph of a compatible door um, that's consistent with the character of the neighborhood on an addition, uh, but it also shows a painted a painted brick chimney um, or painted brick wall, which is a not recommended treatment. Um, so the photographs illustrate the the guidance within each section, and there are pretty clear. Um, captions within the photos, but um, I just wanted to make sure it was clear that um, this is not intended to say that painted brick walls uh, is acceptable. It's just we're talking about the door in this case. Um, I can look at cropping the photos if that helps reduce any confusion, um, but we can again talk about it at the end. Next slide. Other comments, um, one commenter asked for guidance on installation of storm doors and electric car start charging stations, and then another asked for an index, um, and we will certainly add an index if there are any. Um, I'll try to identify all the key terms, but if there are any specific terms that you were looking for in the index, um, just let me know and, and I'll make sure they're in there. So storm doors, um, I propose adding some more guidance um, to the entrances section um, under the existing rehabilitating existing buildings uh, to note that adding storm doors with a single pane configuration that will not obscure the characteristics of the historic door uh, would be recommended. Um, and then for electric cars, car charging stations, this is similar with some other guidance in the document about um, additions of utilities and other equipment to the exterior of the home, but a recommended treatment would be to install charging stations within carports or alongside uh, secondary side elevations in a manner that does not obscure damage or destroy the character defining features of the house. Next. Um, and we looked at standard six here, but this is just a reminder of what the ARB's review standards are. Um, we can go through it later if, if you guys want to review again, um, but if not, um, Denise, you can take it back.
should we pause here for yeah thanks Sarah questions. no I'm sorry okay. it was just, it's taking me a long time to get back to uh to, to with the group so uh thank you so much Sarah that that was a great um a great presentation in, in addressing the the work groups comments and the comments that we got from the community and we really do appreciate your feedback um it's it is very helpful to us to know what you all are thinking so I, I am going to pause here um, to see if there are any questions or comments. Um, Kay did uh, drop a chat in about um, permits for, let's see exactly what she said. Um, so Kay Orr sits on the Architectural Review Board and she is an architect. Um, she, and she said residential reciting does not require a permit for Fairfax County. Residential re-roofs do not require a permit from Fairfax County unless the sheathing is over 25 to uh, 256 square feet. So, I uh, David, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Or any questions? Does anybody have any questions for Sarah? David? Yes, uh, we did have some uh, back and forth about roofing color and uh, and while certainly like a gray or off white would match the, the existing roofing best, we did have from an environmental point of view, however, there might be scenarios where black or white would work better as far as uh, as far as heating or cooling costs. And we were wondering how the ARB would handle a situation like that where there's uh, where there's perhaps a hardship or environmental concerns. And whether just the removal of the word gray while keeping the language about trying to match the existing texture and color might be uh, one way of addressing that concern. Got it. OK, uh, so I I can't answer for the ARB. Um, I can say that just generally uh, they try to work with a homeowner if there is an environmental concern or a um, a, a cost concern, you know, they, they do take those those things into consideration. I think Samantha has um, popped in, so, so <laughs> I think she might want to respond from the ARB's perspective. Samantha Wong is uh, one of our ARB members on this uh, work group. Um, the first thought is I thought for the color, we don't have a, much of a say we do try to mitigate, so make the color more coherent with the whole design. The second part, is, the second thought that I have is, I thought the lighter roofing color is better for the environment versus darker color in terms of solar reflection index. Um, so, that's slightly different than my understanding. Um, perhaps you can give me more information and I can um, look into it. Oh, yes, I may have misspoken, but white, of course, would work better in summer. But for people who are happy with their ceiling, fa um, ceiling fans, they sorry, white would work better in summer. But for people who are happy with their ceiling fans, they might choose a dark color to minimize their heating costs in winter. That was my thinking. As some people have retained like the original screens and have ceiling fans in most rooms, others do not and would very much prefer white. Oh. I think, it, well, yeah, OK, I think it, uh, I think that is a conclude the the um the lighter color is better for the environment in terms of solar reflection index, um, but uh, black may be a more personal preference, depend on what kind of interior setting. 
in so that you, case, we we will look into case by case because it's falling to the color category. Yeah. Right. That's what I was going to say. So, David, you, this is an example of the the uh, the deliberation and the conversation that happens with the architectural review board. Exactly what Samantha was just doing is what happens uh, when you go before the architectural review board. It's a conversation that happens, um, you know, and 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 they take all of those things into consideration. So, um, I think Edith had her hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add on the roofing front that I think really what we're trying to get at is um, the original roofs were natural or neutral in tone. And that was in part because that was sort of all that was available in order to keep water out of your house on a low pitched roof back in 1950. Since then, there have been a whole lot of products that have come on the market, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of TPOs and ECDMs, single membrane, you know, built up membrane roofs. Do the job just just fine and i think what in my mind what it boils down to is if you're in one of the houses i know sarah had some pictures up before where you can't even see the roof um the character of the roof really is a single plane a very crisp line it's meant to be in mid-century modern right um a, a planar kind of monolithic unit to the house right so if you can maintain that i don't think it matters much if the roof is black or white. Um, many of these houses we go by, you can't tell what the membrane is either because you never have an aspect where you look down on the roof. Other houses, you see them very prominently. The roof is a very, this is the first thing you see when you see the house because maybe you're coming down a slope and it's a single story or something like that. And in that case, I think the color might have some more, you know, consideration. But I think in general, I agree with David that I think specifying a color to try to match is difficult because the truth is um, any of the tar and gravel roofs in the neighborhood probably aren't gray. They're probably mossy green mixed with mud, mixed with <laughs> bird droppings. And I, I defy anybody to figure out what color that is. So I think that's, I think we just need to stick with neutral colors um, would be, you know, I think the thought and and you can walk around the neighborhood and see examples of white and see examples of black and see examples of everything in between. And really, they're only the only egregious roofs, I think, are the ones when they're brand new. Any roof is really bright, um, but once they kind of weather in, they're fine. And it's really the the profile and the pitch of the roof that you notice more than anything. So I just wanted to add, add that. Thanks. I think that's right. And and I will just note that design guidelines talk a lot about visibility um, and primary facades versus secondary or rear roof slopes. Um, and it's really that impact of, of the roof. The, they're primarily very low slope flat roofs um, that you don't see. And, and in those cases, an alternative material or, or color is probably acceptable. Um, it's just those few houses where the roof is a, a really dominant feature in the view, um, where color might impact it more. So thanks for that, Edith. Yes, thanks, Edith. Um, so there's somebody, uh, I guess Keith Young, Kevin, excuse me, Kevin Young has his hand up. So it uh, during the work group meetings, um, we don't necessarily take um, comment from uh, attendees where we're, it's a more of a business meeting but we're happy to um, if you want to email me your your comment or your question I'm happy to take that and answer it um, either offline or in the next work group meeting um, I do I, I do see that you have your hand thank you so much so if you could um, just get in touch with me um, and I and I'm happy to answer any question that you have so uh, let's see Kay, Kay, Kay has her hand up. Uh, I'm just curious. I, I also do not want to stop someone. I believe in solar. I believe that we're going to be moving that direction quite strongly in our future. And I don't want to stop someone who has the front face of their house as their best son. I mean, I know that these are guidelines, but I, I, I don't necessarily want 
to keep someone from being able to do that or feel that they can't. And uh, um, that's just a general comment. Um, anyway, just. Thank you, Kay. And and for uh, those of you who don't know, Kay Orr is also on the Architectural Review Board and is a practicing architect along with Samantha, who spoke earlier. So thank you both for that input. Um, Edith, did you have another uh, question? No. I hit that accidentally. I'm sorry. I just okay. meant to say that I agree with Kay. I think okay. <laughs> you know, I, I think this gets back also to the kind of the pleasure and peril of a of a guideline, which is that we're, what we're yeah. really trying to do is say these are historic houses, and within the context of this neighborhood, do your best to try not to upset the apple cart. And I think moving forward, there are going to be more products online that help us achieve those goals. And obviously the ARB is going to have to adapt with that. And I think solar panels are one, you know, really good um, example of that. And I think we've come a long way in solar panels from the days when we had, you know, giant structures pitched at whatever 20 degrees um, on our roofs. That said, I think in this particular neighborhood, it's it, it's pretty rare to find the east or south facing slope um, that's not completely overshadowed by trees. So I think it's probably take a little bit longer to get here. But I mean, I think that we should be allowed to to use solar panels and for that matter, any building product that, you know, um, shows its shows its um its efficiency, efficacy, and also you know budget and all that kind of thing. So I I don't see this as much as prescriptive, and I and I maybe I'm wrong, but correct me if I'm wrong. I think the ARB is much more a almost like a helping hand to help um, shepherd and additions and renovations into something that would not disrespect the character of of the neighborhood. So I I, I guess what I'm saying is I I think there's a lot of flexibility. I, I would agree, and and Kay, I know you have your hand up. I don't know whether you you wanted to add to that, but I, yeah, I believe there is. It's a conversation. Okay, Kate put her hand down. Okay, all right. Thanks so much. Um, that was a good conversation. Let's see. There's a. Is there? There might be a chat here. Yeah, you, I agree with Kate on this. Okay. Thank you. OK. So that takes us to the next, the second part of the agenda. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we're going to move on and start talking about the community um, meeting and the community poll. And I'm going to share my screen again. OK, so I had a question um, today from a community member about the community, the community meeting. Um, it's anticipated in, in May. Um, I think we spoke about it the last time we were together. So what will happen? Uh, we'll, we'll work with the supervisor's office and the Civic Association and a mailer will go out to the entire community. Um, and at that uh, that meeting, um, Hope, hoping it's in person. Um, if we have to be electronic, we can accommodate, but it would be good to to get everybody together and talk about um, what the work group has, the work that the work group has been doing, the work that the staff has been doing. We'll go over the history, the study uh, with timelines and milestones. And then staff will present um, our findings from the study which are required by the zoning ordinance, which include, um, but not limited to, um, uses that are likely to have an adverse effect on the character of the district, the boundaries of the district, the character defining features, the contributing and non-contributing properties. We'll go over the design guidelines and we'll have a draft of the zoning uh, ordinance amendment. So that will all happen at the community meeting in May. Oh, 
And um, the Civic the uh, Palm Sur Acre Civic Association has requested that staff um, help facilitate a poll uh, on their behalf for um, after the presentation at the community meeting. So that would be after staff gives their presentation of their findings and their recommendations um, that the, the poll would go out to the entire uh, community. And I'm going to turn this over now um, to Edith so uh, she can speak to that effort. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Alrighty, thank you, Denise. <clears throat> so I just wanted to thank everybody who's joining us from the neighborhood who maybe the, for whom this might be the first meeting and also um, generally just people who are newly focused on our historic overlay dis district effort. Um, so I wanted, and, and the reason I just wanted to speak super briefly about how we got here. Um, several years ago, our over 70 year old neighborhood experienced two teardowns within months of each other. And the buildings that replaced these teardowns were out of scale with the neighborhood and they bore none of the character of the architecture. And this raised alarm um, and a lot of hand wringing and discussion about what could be done. It was really the first time um, that a very visible teardown happened. It was the first time that two happened in rapid succession. Um, and there was a lot of concern about what would become of our mature landscape. And are we just going to be the next Northern Virginia neighborhood to fall prey to development of kind of overscaled homes for this you know, for the adjacencies of these homes. Um, and so back then, pre-COVID, um, much of these discussions happened in social gatherings, and there was a lot of, a lot of discussion. And the general sense was that people were really concerned about their properties, both from the perspective of livability. Um, how do you live if you're in a modest home with a lot of windows looking out onto nature? How do you live in that home anymore if suddenly something three times your size um, comes in next door because these houses were originally cited to take advantage of view corridors. And so if those are abruptly aborted, the houses start to feel very small very quickly. But also um, from the perspective of property values, what happens to my house if I'm suddenly in a historic home, but I'm suddenly next to something thunderingly huge that doesn't share the characteristics or the landscape or the tree coverage. And so this effort to pursue a historic overlay district for HRA was born out of that concern, out of that neighborhood concern. Um, the history of this effort is really well documented on our homesrunacres.com website. And so I urge you to go there to read the various write-ups and flyers and um, all that. But in a nutshell, timeline wise, <clears throat> we had an information table at Day in the Park in October, I believe of 2019. Again, this is pre-COVID, seems very nostalgic now. Um, and it was attended, we had a heritage staff member on board to, to um, answer, you know, they were available to answer questions. And then quickly on the heels of Day in the Park, we sent out informational flyers to every house in the community. Um, we then held a neighborhood-wide survey in December of 2019, so a couple months after we rolled out the effort, which yielded a majority um, in favor of pursuing studying an HOD. And I mentioned this and it was important for us to have this survey for a couple of reasons. One, from the onset, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the uh, bullseye, you throw your darts at me. I'm the one who initiated all this. I think um, initially it was, as a practicing architect, I've worked in HODs and they, they don't seem cumbersome. I know a lot of clients who've actually purposely bought into HODs or more restrictive um, communities like that just because they want to retain what they find when they purchase their homes. So I, I wasn't entirely sure if, if one would be applicable for our neighborhood, but I was um, encouraged by our then supervisor to pursue one as a tool for preserving the character of the neighborhood. And so really it began as an exploration about, you know, could we use, could we avail ourselves of this tool? Most neighborhoods can't because they're not historic and we already had historic registry. And then the second goal of mine was, you know, so the first goal being, is it applicable? Is it desired? The second goal was to not have our neighborhood fall apart 
in pursuit of this because we have a precedent in Holland Hills. Um, they got their historic registry um, designation after we did, but they are ahead of us on a homes on a uh, historic overlay district. And, you know, you can imagine it's a hot topic, right? People love their homes, love their properties, buy them for different reasons. And, um, you know, the question is, am I giving up rights? And then other people see it as a, well, where do your rights end and mine begin? Does it really happen at the property line or does it happen somewhere else? If, if, what you're doing on your property negatively impacts what I, what I, uh, my property and, and what I, my livability on my property. And you can talk to a couple of people in our neighborhood who have had adjacent structures go up and, the, and you know, it's, it's illuminating to hear what they have to say about living next to that. So, so the, it was really important from the beginning to make sure that this was an all in um, effort. And so when we held the first survey, we actually sent out an army of people who knocked on every single door, all 350 or whatever it is, houses in the neighborhood, both those deemed contributing and those deemed non-contributing by the um, historic registry to make sure that every single person had an opportunity to learn about an HOD, to look at the flyers that we had sent out, to have access to websites, um, excuse me, and for people who didn't have um, access to computers or whatever that they understood kind of you know printouts of what was of what this sort of entailed so that when we took a vote um we we got i can't remember david heckman probably has a percentage but i can't remember what percentage of the neighborhood voted but it was a very high percentage and we had a clear majority in favor of pursuing this so that's why we did it then um <clears throat> as soon as that was done we were able to go to the supervisor and say hey there's a majority support in the community to pursue this. They then presented it to the Board of Supervisors who approved the effort um, in January of 2020. That takes us to what would normally be um, the beginning of meeting in person. But of course, by the time the heritage staff have had ramped up and done, well, actually when they began their survey to assess which houses um, in the intervening years since our historic registry had been potentially rendered non-contributing um, they had to do that with masks on and separation and you know distancing and all that kind of stuff and then we were never able to actually meet as a work group in person and i think that's really kind of sad because the whole idea was we'd have our work group we'd be working you know in these meetings and we'd be able to have residents just walk into the meetings and listen to what was going on so um unfortunately all of our meetings have had to be um, held virtually um, the first few meetings were to establish contributing versus non-contributing houses. And then after that, we switched to looking at guidelines. Um, and um, I think in June of 2021, the county, so this past summer, the county shared with the with us the first ones and then um, the, sub, the, the uh, subsequent ones. And that kind of brings us to um, today. Um, I think where we go now is um just wanted to capture one thing somebody sorry somebody's um texting me I'm, or chatting with me i'm sorry or emailing me i'm sorry um where we go now is to complete the guidelines and i'm i'm actually happy that there's more um interest in the community to really look at this as we come down the the final line and i'm really guilty because i haven't submitted my edits yet um and then to hold this community meeting and then it was really important again in the name of utter transparency and also you know community buy-in that we hold another vote this was not required by the county it's not required to happen in order to get an hod but it was important to myself and those of us in the work group um, to have another vote to make sure that everybody um, had a chance to kind of look at the guidelines, look at where the HOD is, um, think about them again for their property, you know, have an opinion about that and be able to vote again on whether they are in support of an HOD or not. So I, I just wanna make that abundantly clear because I think sometimes the tone in some discussions veers towards you know, this is something Fairfax is doing to us, and it's not. We're doing it to ourselves. 
Um, but also I think sometimes there's the there's maybe miscommunication or misunderstanding of exactly what it is we're trying to achieve with this. And I think that's um, maybe the most important thing to get across that, you know, all of us working in the work group, whether we are pro against or undecided about an HOD, live in this neighborhood. Um, and we want what's best for this neighborhood. And I think, you know, I have my personal opinions. I, I myself didn't start out necessarily um, looking for an HOD. When I first began the Friends of Homes Run Acres, it was an effort to try to um, bring people who were people who either understood or who were interested in mid-century modern, um, try to connect them with uh, with buyers or with sellers in the neighborhood so that we had people who just in, it kind of initially or already understood or appreciated the architecture buy into this neighborhood. And I still think that's probably the best, the best way to preserve a neighborhood is to have people interested in it and want to protect it. But I, I think the writing is on the wall with the teardowns and with um, just the, the general scale of our properties and where the location is, where the location is, and in some cases, um, <clears throat> some of the houses that are 70 years old that haven't been as well maintained, potentially being easy targets for teardown. So, um, that's that's kind of how we got to where we are. Again, I think um, please go to the homesrunacres.com website to find and just scroll through to the drop downs to find information on the historic overlay district and see kind of the history of our neighborhood through that. And then also, as Denise mentioned, go to the um, fairfaxcounty.gov um, you know, website to and Google HRA HOD for all of the information on the meetings um, that we've held as a work group. Thank you. And I'll, obviously anybody in the neighborhood, if you've got questions, well, most of you do anyway, but you know my email address. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Edith. Uh, Kay had her hand up. Kay, did you have something to? I question do. Okay. No, I just want to add, um, unfortunately, people are still going to be able to build by right. And so the viewed corridor, they don't have to, uh, uh, you know, that is a nice thing that y'all have been enjoying. But as the ARB, we cannot stop them if they build by right. So um, I just, I know that that's the kind of thing that you'd like to um, preserve, but that's something we cannot do. So just a heads up on that. No, I understand. I understand that, Kay. And I, um, you know, I think I think we've also had some pushback in the community saying, "Well, wait a minute. If these are recommendations and they're not restrictions, then um, what?" You know what prevents somebody from tearing them down and putting up a McMansion? And I think the answer is, you know, nothing does. I mean, we live in a Dillon Rule state, and you do what you want with your property. Um, but again, I think in many, many cases, most cases, when people become educated about something, sometimes it changes their mind. And if we can catch, you know, one or two people who might do something aggressive. Um, and we can sort of, you know, bring that in line a little bit so that they still achieve what they want, but that it's more respectful to their neighbors, you know, then I think we've already achieved something. So we, we owe a lot to the people in the 70s, 80s and 90s and aughts and 10s who, who chose to gray and stay and didn't move out of the neighborhood. Um, and we could get into a whole philosophical discussion about that. I mean, it, you know, in one case you could say this is a a really great example of, of how a multi-generational neighborhood can exist, and that is to have houses where people can gray and stay that aren't so big that they have to move. I think that's part of the reason our community has stayed as tight as it has is because there's always a critical mass of people who've been there 20, 30, 40 years who kind of move through, envelop, and welcome the new people. It certainly was the case when we moved in, and I think that lends a certain um, you know, richness to the neighborhood in general. So none of that is possible if all of the houses are four or 5,000 feet and people necessarily move out once they've raised their kids. It changes the demographics quite a bit. So anyway, I think, you know, I'm not fooled into thinking that this is the salvation, but I, I do agree with Linda Smith, former supervisor who said, 
it is a tool that most neighborhoods can't avail themselves as, of, and I think it might be worth looking at. So, um, but I thanks Kay. I think it's important that everybody acknowledges <laughs> what we're up against, or you know, what can and can't be done. Right, the limitation, sure. Um, so there was a, a question about buy right development. I'm going to ask Lily to chime in here. Um, I can I can give you my. Yeah, there we go. But there was a question. Can you define by right development? So by right development typically means, um, for example, if you were building a structure that meets all the zoning requirements in terms of, you know, development standards, in terms of uh, setback, in terms of height, in terms of um, um, other requirements that may be included, you know, you provide the required parking, all of that, then it's considered a by right development. Um, if you, for example, want something um, to either encroach a little bit into a required setback, for example, because for different reasons, you cannot meet the zoning code um, requirements, then it's no longer a by right development and you would need to either get uh, a, an approval from the Board of Zoning Appeals of a <clears throat> special permit or a variance, or you may have to go to the Board of Supervisors and get a, a special exception approved in order to be able to um, request these changes that do not meet the uh, development standards in the um, underlying zoning district. The same for a use, for example, by right use would be residential single family detached is uh, by right use in uh, R3 zoning district where this community is located. Um, there are certain uses that may be permitted with a special exception or a special permit, for example, churches may be allowed if a special permit or a special exception is approved. So that type of use is not by right. Um, I hope that answers your question. Much more thoroughly than I would have. So thank you, Lily. <laughs> so uh, David, you had your hand up. It's a related question. Mm -hmm. And that is, there seems to be a, a really a big gap between what the zoning ordinance says about um, approval of permits um, in an overlay district and um, I guess either political or legal precedents that uh, or just historical precedents that apply to the ARB where there's an emphasis on approving projects. So I think we'd all want a little more clarity on basically what would lead the ARB to deny a project and what standards are used um, when a project isn't really in conformance with um, the guidelines. Um, and then a specific question I had was actually with Holland Hills, whose zoning ordinance amendment seems to apply a stricter standard than found elsewhere in the zoning ordinance. And I, I want to make sure that I'm reading the Holland Hills ordinance correctly. Uh, and if and if they are seeking a higher standard, we would want to make sure we I think we'd want to ask neighbors whether they prefer to go with this higher standard or maybe with a, a lesser standard of review. And I, I know these are open ended questions, but at the same time. Um, well, we know that guidelines are different from from laws and zoning ordinance requirements. I think we we want to know what kind of conformance and what sort of uh, and whether a single whether violating a single guideline might ever lead to uh, to a denial or a holdup of uh, of a building permit. Thank you. So Lily, could you um, could you address the Holland the potential Holland Hills um, zoning ordinance changes that they're the, the amendment that they're going to be putting forward to the board in the planning commission, and then I'll try to answer the other question. 
Thank you. Sure. Um, so the zoning ordinance amendment uh, part for the proposed or potential Holland Hills um, historic overlay district um, would be similar to what would need to be done for the um, for this community as well. Um, any you know potential establishment of a Historic overlay district requires three or three major main components, which is amendment to the zoning ordinance, amendment to the comprehensive plan, and amendment uh, and a rezoning application that would um, basically uh, add the new historic overlay district boundary on the official zoning map. Um, so for the proposed Holland Hills uh, historic overlay district, the Zoning ordinance amendment did not propose um, additional restrictions beyond what the underlying zoning district already, you know, enforces or restricts, except for um, limitation on how high uh, structures other than detached uh, single-family residences can be um, that it, the proposed Holland Hills HOD is located in a R2 zoning district. Majority of the structures are zoned R2. There are a few lots that are, are uh, zoned R1 and uh, a few more, uh, maybe a couple that are zoned R4. Um, the height limit in the zoning district for residential residentially zoned district between R1, R2, R3, R4 is more or less the same, it's 35 feet. However, um, the zoning ordinance currently allows structures other than detached single family residences to go up to 60 feet. These structures typically, again, are not by right, going back to um, what I mentioned earlier, they're not by right, they um, either require a special exception or a special permit, but they could go um, up to 30, I'm sorry, 60 feet. I was trying to read the chat. Uh, they can go up to 60 feet under current zoning ordinance regulations. So what we are proposing is to limit the height, the height of um, other structures other than detached single family residential structures to 35 feet to match the maximum height permitted for residential structures. So that is um, the one change that is uh, proposed. Other than that, you know, um, the setbacks, the uh, allowable height, um, the location and allowable height for um, I think we lost Lily. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you you froze for a moment. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So um, I hope I, I do see the the um, message from Kay that what are the setbacks required for R3 by right? So I believe the setbacks for the R3, and I'll confirm this before the end of the meeting, but the front is 35 feet, the side is 15 feet, and the uh, rear is 25 feet, I believe. So uh, for the proposed Holland Hills Historic Overlay District, the only change that we are uh, proposing is to limit the height for other structures from reduce it from 60 feet to 35 feet to keep it in um, consistent with what is permitted for the detached accessory structures. I think I see some questions in the chat. Um, it says the Holland Hills Amendment requires substantial conformance with design guidelines. Is this the same standard as other overlay district? Um, before I let Denise go into that and explain, I just wanted to mention, in addition to the height limit, what they, so what the um, uh, establishment of a historic overlay district does is it basically um, allows the ARB or gives the ARB authority on that district 
to review any um, uh, proposals that require building permit as discussed at the beginning of this meeting. So the establishment of any HOD in addition to any changes in the zoning ordinance will also um, basically put that district into the historic overlay district requiring ARB review for any future um, um, additions or constructions that require a building permit or um, you know site permit or uh, any type of discretionary review like a, a special permit variance and rezoning and special exception all of those will require the ARB review and recommendation while building permits will require the ARB review and approval so in in doing so the ARB's task to ensure that what is being proposed will be in substantial conformance with the design guidelines that the ARB will approve once an HOD is established. And Denise, if you want to add to that. Actually, Lily, I think you 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 covered it. So I, and I think this kind of gets to David's what David's question about when will the ARB deny something? In what what what's that what's that point? And I um, I can appreciate why why there's that question, um, but keep in mind to, to Kay's point it is uh, if if something's being built by right the, the ARB you know, they have they the you know, it's a conversation um, so the, the there's um, there's only so much they can do when they're having if somebody is you know really determined to have uh their mediterranean villa um it, as much as the arab i mean the arab at that point may deny but it's a conversation and it's it's a case by case basis there are guidelines the arab does have stand the secretary of the interior standards for the treatment of historic properties that they have to follow um so at that point that that might be a denial and then there is an appeals process uh, but you know, um, it it is a con I just can't. I know I keep saying it, but it is a conversation um, that the applicant and the ARB have. Uh, there's also um, their process allows for what's called workshops, which are informal reviews where you come, um, especially when you're in the uh, design stage, and you have that discussion and you get uh, professional input. Um, from the the architects and the landscape architect and the archaeologist, then they give you feedback on your project that will help shape it to be um, more in conformance with the design guidelines. And and then when you get to the point where you are uh, at the review, the official review process, then that uh, goes much more smoothly because you've already had that conversation and. Uh, worked with the architectural review board to get it to the point where there uh, is conformance to the design guidelines. So um, I'm hoping that that answered your question, David. It, if I could just um, correct the setbacks, I, I gave uh, the setbacks for the Artuzoni district. That's fresh in my mind from the <laughs> proposed Holland Hills. <laughs> but the R3 uh, setbacks are 30 feet for the front, 12 feet for the side, and the rear is the same as 25 feet. It's the same as R2. Thanks, Lily. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that you are, um, your brain is focused on Holland Hill, so uh, thanks for looking that up. Samantha, did you have something to add from the ARB's perspective? <laughs> And you, we keep coming circle on this one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Um, not really. Um, it, it's really a conversation, and the uh, um, ARB has a, a people from different uh, profession, uh, landscape and building and historical. So we do have uh, some knowledge in our back. And so when this comes to conversation. And also we see a lot of case. So we have that resource that we can try to convince um, uh, applicant to tweet their design, and change their design and become more acceptable.
can, can I address Kevin just real quickly? Um, Kevin, by right, they can build to 30 feet front, 12 feet side, and 25 foot rear. We don't have a percent lot cover requirement like they do in Arlington County. So someone can build a block there. And we, although we can help mold with that thing with the roof and the different, basically their footprint can be exactly with that setback. And that's what I'm thinking people are wanting to prevent, but I, that's what they can't. And we, as a ARB, can't stop them is my understanding. I mean, I, you know, somebody tell me I'm crazy. Nope, okay. Nope, I think you're correct, Kay. Um, and I think to the second point, um, it, 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 what a denial. I, I think I was just reading that there, um, no, I don't want to say that there hasn't been a denial. And I'm sorry, I could, let me look that up. What would, uh, how long it's been since there, there's there been a denial. I just, I don't know in recent memory, in four or five years, um, if there's been a denial of a per of an ARB with an ARB denial, I think what they do, they ask for a deferral and um, you come back and you have again, you have a conversation. Samantha's yeah, shaking her head. Yes, nodding her head. I, yes, yeah, I will try to take the late and the antenna case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, exactly. So that that's um, another you know, uh, uh, something that was not the ARB was not uh, ready uh, to to uh, to deny or ready to advance, but they also didn't take advantage of the workshop, um, which would have uh, probably helped them in their design. So uh, that case was deferred, and and um, hopefully they'll come back and you know and have that conversation. So. Um, I think there might be a chat. Yeah, there's additional questions. So it says so the HOD has the potential to change the zoning ordinance and include language that relates it to guidelines, as David stated above. Um, yeah, I was wondering where uh, I don't I think that might not be from the zoning ordinance amendment. So. I think though, um, it, I mean, I don't know, Lily, if you can answer that question quickly, but I do think this is, um, I, I, I appreciate the questions and I'm going to uh, make a record of them and make sure that we answer them um, and answer all the questions, either um, personally, you know, um, if you wanna email me or we'll come back at the next work group meeting and we will have answers to, to these questions specifically. But we do um, need to, to move on and talk about the poll uh, and and but if any other work group members have any um, additional questions specifically, I'll just pause here for a second. David has this. Nope, David. Less of a, a question Sorry. than just for the record. The mm -hmm. the Wellington at River Farm overlay district also has the substantial conformance language. So I have a feeling that's just the new standard boilerplate, but older districts don't seem to have that language. And I wanted to. I, I wanted to see whether that language changes things or is just formalizing standards that already existed. And David, do you know if that's in the comprehensive plan amendment or the zoning amendment? In the zoning or amendment. The zoning amendment. In the yes. zoning amendment. Okay. Yeah, the comprehensive plan requirement is just general conformance. Yep. Yeah. So thank you very much for that question and for the direction. We'll go and take a look at it and and get back to you. Thank you. I'm okay. trying to raise my hand. This is Keith, but it did, won't raise. But I okay. had a question from somebody in our community last week, which was, are there any other HODs either approved or in the works for single family houses except for the Holland Hills one? I'm not familiar with any other, and I thought I'd share. It. Um, so let's see. There are a few that have housing in the district. Um, 
but these are the first two specifically for subdivisions. Right. <clears throat> I guess the question was raised because um, the discussion was about who would attend the town meeting in terms of uh, being available to answer questions. And the suggestion was that we have somebody from an already existing HOD who could talk about the process. But then I couldn't think of any HOD that would have been comparable where somebody could have come to answer questions. I uh, it, I think it depends. So um, I think Edith, Edith or David, I think they're, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what you're uh, referring to, Keith, so I'm going to let either Edith or David jump in here. Well, Keith. we're having a town meeting, right? We're having a meeting of the community to discuss the guidelines. Oh, at the community meeting, you're suggesting that um, somebody from another historic overlay district be present to answer questions. Yes, if there were anything that were comparable, but I can't think of anything that is comparable. That was the problem. Keith, this is Edith. Um, we talked about internally, a few of us have talked about maybe you weren't in on that conversation about um there are two neighborhoods that are mid-century because i do think it matters the the you know the, the style of architecture is a little bit different a little bit harder to codify mid-century than it is for example colonial um but um holland hills is ahead of us in the process so i think it's th though they do not yet have an hod it's not in place nevertheless i think that they can speak to the um process and also we can learn from those who don't support it and those who do support it and their reasoning why because i think that'll just help to inform us all um another neighborhood that is not in fairfax county but that does currently have a historic overlay district to my knowledge is potomac overlook in montgomery county it is not in fairfax county it's in maryland obviously different rules different laws etc but I think um, the, the general underpinning of an HOD is probably similar, um, even if specific zoning um, requirements in the zoning ordinance for Montgomery County are different than Fairfax County. Yeah, so the, the question that I got related more to the procedure of going to the ARB, of course, Holland Hills would not have had that experience by the time we have our meeting. Right. Um, so that, that 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 was the purpose of it. No, I understand. So <clears throat> I think maybe what could be beneficial is to have somebody from the ARB on hand to walk through a um, potential scenario, because I think that's, you know, what. so what we talked about, just to back up for a second, what we talked about is potential, the community meeting is going to be a pretty full meeting. But what we talked about is maybe having in rapid su succession uh, a meeting ahead of the community meeting where we could have representatives and we can discuss who they would be, but I would think minimally, you know, somebody from Potomac Overlook and or um, Holland Hills just to talk about decision making on, you know, because these are all people who bought into a neighborhood before it was an HOD and had to come to the decision as a community of whether they wanted to pursue this or not. I think there's, in, you know, we can glean information from that. Um, and then maybe, you know, we do something like have, um, I think it's sometimes good to have sort of test cases. I've actually tried, I have a, a couple of um, projects under underway right now, and I was hoping to take one of them through the ARB just as a test case, even though there's no HOD, but I don't think that that's practical at this point, although I'm open to it if, if the ARB is. But to do something that's like a, you know, just a, a put out a couple of scenarios and, and have the ARB on hand, or at least somebody from the ARB on hand to discuss how that would be addressed, where it would go from there, you know, what what happens to the property owner at that point if they if they you know promote something that doesn't quite fit, where you know, and just kind of walk us through the steps of what that would what that would look like. So if I if I can add to that, Edith, um, the architectural review board's meetings have been recorded for almost two years now. So there's a YouTube channel for uh, ARB meetings. If you want to see what the process looks like and what that meeting looks like in those the conversations that I've been referring to. 
So um, you should do, you know, that's a that's a really good way. And, and actually, when um, applicants uh, have, you know, people who aren't used to going to the ARB um, have asked me and I've referred them to those um, videos and it's helpful. Um, you get to see what, what's required and what's expected and just sort of the the process as you sit in a meeting and um, talk to these people. Of course, it is virtual um, in one day will we be back in person? Um, but the the process won't change. It'll just be a, you know slightly different. You'll actually be um, with a group of people and not uh, talking to a video screen as we're doing now. Um, so, and I think David might have had something to add, or maybe that was left over. That was just a clarification that it's the same architects as Homes on Acres, so. They have different sites and different roofing, but a lot in common. Uh, they have their planning commission's recommendation of approval, and uh, it, it will be adopted this year, I believe. But they're they're not yet uh, an operating historic district. Got it. That's Potomac Overlook. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That thank you for the question, though, Keith. Um, I appreciate it. And I did uh, make a note about maybe having an architectural review board member on hand for the community meeting. That sounds like a, a great idea. Okay. Well, um, it's almost eight, so I'm going to uh, start talking about the community poll um, with you all. And I'm going to share my screen. Again, there we go. OK, so uh, we staff has been uh, meeting to sort of work out how this how, what this poll might look like and, and how we're going to run it. So we're starting to think about it. Um, and we're going to uh, essentially emulate the um, the process that was taken for the poll for Holland Hills. So I'm going to run you through that. Um, so first, there'll be uh, postcards um, with QR codes um, that are mailed out to every resident um, and that will direct people to a web page that we'll, we'll be using for, for the poll. Um, the unique identifier will be parcel numbers and we're thinking a one vote per parcel. So we've looked into the uh, languages spoken to address um, any uh, language translation um, needs that might need, you know, so we're um, planning on having uh, Spanish and Vietnamese um, uh, printed on the card, a uh, sentence that will direct people to um, translation services for the poll. And then um, actually the poll will be um, use uh, Google translation services to translate the pages, the online poll. And I just wanted to check in with you all if you know of any other uh, primary languages that you're aware of um, that we should possibly be planning for uh, in, in the participation. We identified the Spanish and Vietnamese from uh, the census records, but um, you might, you know, your bet your neighborhood best. So, if you do have any suggestions, please let me know. Uh, paper ballots will be available on request, and um, the paper ballots, uh, the in other lang translated in other languages, we can do in a three-day turnaround or so, and get those mailed out to people. So an approximate timeline um, for we found out that printing takes approximately uh, three to four weeks with the county once it's approved by the work group. Uh, the mailing will take about a week to get out um, out of the mail, our, our mail room. And then we'll leave the poll open for uh, four weeks. Mail in ballots uh, will need to be postmarked um, the same day for by the same day that the poll closes. So we'll need to, you know, make sure that we're um, making 
giving that information to people or requesting mail-in ballots so they understand that there will be a cutoff date, um, essentially the same date that the, the online poll closes. And then um, for the mail-in ballots, we'll need to make sure that we have an address or the parcel number so they can be uh, counted. And then staff is going to manually enter those paper ballots into the um, the public input poll that the, the web page that we're going to be using. Um, tabulation and, and analysis of approximately three to four weeks, especially depending on how many paper polls we receive. And then um, we'll have another community meeting for uh, the poll result results. And that's just adding up all the time in about eight to 10 weeks after the launch. And this again would happen after the community meeting that we're planning in May. So uh, for the work group, um, there are a couple of things that we need to answer. One is um, determining what the purpose of the poll is. So what questions would the community um, like answered? And um, how will the information gathered be used? So what is what is your what are your thoughts about using the the information? And I'm going to just show you. Hopefully this works. Let's see. Can you all see my screen opening? Can you see that? Mm -hmm. We can only see the PowerPoint. PowerPoint. OK, so let me stop sharing. And reshare. OK, can you see the web page now? Yes, we can. Thank you. OK, and here is the um, the sample poll from Holland Hills and. Um, you know that this is really up to the work group. Uh, this is something that we used. Um, it's a, a format. Um, called public input and um, it, it walks you through a series of pages that you have to read to get to the end where the questions are. So um, at the beginning, the first page is a um, letter from the supervisor talking about the historic overlay district, and then you scroll all the way down to the bottom and you hit continue. So at the top, here are the tabs across. Um, there's a, a background in the boundary. So this gives the boundary map. And then you can click on it for a larger PDF. And then um, there's the links to the, the draft design guidelines, links to the zoning ordinance amendment, um, draft zoning ordinance amendment, and then uh, links to the comprehensive plan amendment draft. And then again, we have more links to the history of the um, district, to the work group, and then you continue on. And then um, FAQs and FAQ page about what historic overlay districts are, uh, what regulations and design guidelines do, uh, the architecture, what is the architectural review board, essentially the information that I just went through um, at the beginning of this presentation, you go through it. And this, this is for, of course, the community members who may not have been um, participating or following along with the work group. Uh, all of this information is presented in one place for them. And then we we'll click continue. <clears throat> and again, links to the uh, zoning, the draft zoning ordinance amendment, the draft comprehensive plan amendment, and the draft rezoning. Continue. The A or B. Um, the building permit process and the ARB review, just a little flow chart of how that all works. Continue. Um, the design guidelines again, so it's a, there's a link to the design guidelines for review. And then you get to the poll. So there's a there's a lot of background information um, for review. 
before you can, <clears throat> well, you can skip th through all the information, but um, it's provided uh, to educate people on what a historic overlay district is, what the ARB review, what the ARB review process looks like, um, and what the design guidelines are. So all of everything that all the, the whole study, everything that we've been doing all along would be presented in this format. And then here are the poll questions. And this is where, <clears throat> excuse me, you enter your name and um, email address. And then here are the for, here are the poll questions. And I have these on a larger screen that I think I'm going to share that way. Because they're highlighted. OK, so the first question and this this is um, these were questions that were um, worked through with the work group and with the supervisor's office. Have you attended or watched any community meetings regarding the proposed Holland Hills Historic Overlay District district? If not, we strongly recommend that you visit the Holland Hills Plan Amendment web page, view the community meetings and the work group meetings and there and then a link to that. So um, that's a yes or no question. And then if the proposed Holland Hills Historic Overlay District is adopted, the Fairfax County Architectural Review Board will review and may require modifications to any proposed building permit for certain exterior renovations, construction, or demolitions before approval to ensure that the proposal is in harmony with the Historic Overlay District's design guidelines. Examples of proposals that would require a building permit include decks, screened-in porches, and building additions. And then um, the question is, what is your view of the ARB approval requirement for building permits, building permit improvements with, within the proposed historic overlay district? And then it's a sliding scale at the bottom, negative to positive. And you just take your cursor and uh, go, you know, across and, um, and select your selection. And then the third question, which is what was um, the focus of the um, really uh, it, of the poll was, do you support establishing a historic overlay district for the Holland Hills neighborhood as explained in the background information tabs of the public input pages? And public input is just the that platform that I just showed you. Um, and then it's just a, a no opinion, uh, excuse me, no, no opinion or yes. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, I'd like to have a, a conversation if I could with you all about those questions um, and to see if there's, you know, other things that you might wanted to ask if you wanted to ask those specific questions, um, you know, what it is that you're looking, looking to ask the community to get their feedback on. Um, and then we can, you know, we're, we're happy to create, you know, essentially the same thing. Or if you think that that's too much information or anyway, I just would like to get your feedback on on uh, the Holland Hills poll and see if it's something that you'd like to emulate for the Holmes Run Acres poll. If no one else has any questions, um... One additional question that I would love to have on the poll, but it might be impossible because we have to have the boundaries drawn prior to this poll, most likely, is just Upper Executive Avenue. Uh, there's been some discussion this week of whether we include these homes that are like a mixture of Cape Cods and Ramblers, uh, McMansion, I think, uh, but mostly smaller homes from the 40s and 50s. Um, They've always been a part of the Civic Association and neighborhood, but obviously uh, different, different design, different history. Um, and we've been trying to solicit feedback from residents over our neighborhood listserv. I haven't heard back from anyone. We can, of course, canvas. I can tell you that most of the residents there voted for this overlay district study. They were they were asked about the overlay district prior to the study beginning. 
Um, however, of course, a vote in favor of the study is very different from a vote in favor of enacting the historic overlay district. But uh, I think people there, like most of the neighborhood, have opinions, but not strong opinions. And I don't know if it's even possible to have a question about boundaries. But if you find a if you find a way to make that happen, it might be a helpful question. Thank you. So um, the houses on Upper Executive Avenue were part of the um, the board matter authorizing staff to do the study. So staff is including them in their analysis. Yes, they were part of they were part of the majority vote. Uh, okay. Everyone in that part of the neighborhood either voted yes or didn't or may have been opposed, but didn't send in a, a, a vote on the petition. <clears throat> OK, thank so, you. But we, we also don't know. Again, they may have voted in favor of the historic overlay district study, knowing that their house was likely to be treated differently, perhaps. Yeah. Or they well, may have been aware yeah. of that. A lot of people consider their houses historic and and would be surprised, while others are would probably be delighted to know that they might have less strict requirements. But certainly there are people who there are people who, who have bought into that part of the neighborhood and actually have put up like mid-century fixtures on their house, even if the even if the home design is not mid-century. So there's probably a, a great diversity of opinions from apathy to strong support to uh, to probably um, strong disapproval. So if they're if they're definitely not going to be part of the historic overlay district, then maybe we don't need to survey them. But I think some people may be under the impression or may have been under the impression until this week that that they might be a part of the overlay district. So yeah, I mean, it's part of our study. They they are included in the yes, study. Yes, and in fact, yeah. uh, and we, we I've tried to make it clear we haven't even had discussions about the boundaries yet. Our whole survey has started with surveying the properties that are already part of the National Register nomination. Right. That we haven't really had discussion of the elementary school or upper executive, but. Whatever right. we decide, I mean, we might still want to have a question about that part of the neighborhood. OK, thank you. Right. Something to discuss anyway. Mm -hmm. So it, that's a it's a good point. I try to figure out how to. How to word that and, and what exactly we're trying to. To to ask. Because are you asking like, are you asking the entire uh, homes or an acres neighborhood, whether a, um, the homes on upper executive should be included in the boundaries is is that that's what I hear the question again. Yeah, the survey design is really complicated. Do you mm -hmm. ask that question, but throw but only consider the responses from that part of the neighborhood? Right. Or do you condition that question based on it would be extremely hard, I th think, based on the parcel ID? Well, when you get your answer, then what do you do? I think that's, that's the, the question. That's going to be my yeah. question. What, yes. do you, what do you do with that answer? And is that is that something for the ballot, or is that an extra effort we need to make for that area specifically, um, independent of the ballot? Because I would think we might need to canvas them. Right. It might not be formal, but. I mean, it, it's so much easier to vote yes or no when you know what the boundaries are, as Holland Hills did. Yeah, it would certainly think. would be a nightmare to administer a, an online ballot on the boundaries, I would think. I right. would think that uh, an informal survey, if it yielded an overwhelming uh, support for being within the boundary, then we could just simply tell the staff that. And uh, I would think that would be... Uh, carry a lot of weight in terms of what you decide about the boundaries. Um, or if they're uniformly opposed, then it's a bigger problem because clearly whatever happens on the top of executive really affects our whole neighborhood. If you enter our neighborhood from that side past a bunch of McMansions, it's not a particularly good opening. So I, I think uh, there's a very strong argument for including them. I mean, I think certainly with Nicole, we had always talked about um, 
including them from the aspect of modesty of scale, um, because though many of them are not mid-century and they were um, built after you know, the Luria brothers and Bodors had, had, and Gaddis had, had moved on, I think nevertheless, they maintain big tree coverage. They have more mature landscaping. They're you know, more or less um, sited within the landscape. And they are most importantly modest in scale with the exception of maybe one or two that were um, built in the last decade or so. So I think from that perspective, if, if again, we're talking about um, trying to preserve the character of the neighborhood and not of any one particular building, then I think to Keith's point about the fact that what happens up there affects um, any of the mid-century modern houses that are adjacent to it, I think that would be a strong argument for including them in the uh, in the HOD. So uh, yeah, I they they're included in this the project study. Is it necessary to ask the question about? whether they should be included in the HOD or not? I would say not in our big neighborhood poll. That ought to be I agree. I don't think our neighborhood cares much one way or the other uh, in, in, in that sense. I also am not we, sure. We <laughs> well, I'm also not sure if, if, if they're in the study and they're non-contributing, even though there's a collection of them and even though they're not mid-century, how does that differentiate from, or how does that differ from other non-contributing homes that are in the HOD that might have at their core an original house, but but are, you know, are no longer contributing? So I, I guess is upper executive treated as a gathering of non-contributing homes? Is that how it's because it sounds like that's what you're saying, Denise, that it's it's included in the study, it's included in the boundary of the study, um, but they are non-contributing. So, I mean, um, yes, exactly. I think that they would be, um, the question is, um, are they included? They're included in the boundary of the study, so staff must analyze them. It's staff's determination whether they can they are continue to be included in the boundaries of the historic overlay district as non-contributing structures, or whether they are they are the boundaries are drawn to exclude the and and if you look at the national register boundaries, the upper executive um, drive or a, a avenue can't remember. I'm sorry, but um, they are not included in the national register. Uh, district, but they were included um, in the board authorization, so staff is studying them. Back to the survey, there were a number of Holland Hills questions about outreach. I didn't. I want to be careful in even posing this question because it mm -hmm. sounds discriminatory, but I would be curious to know the opinion of people who moved to the neighborhood after the study was authorized. On on my cul-de-sac, about half the homes have turned over during the during the pandemic, which is extremely atypical for I, I think until recently I was the newest or second newest homeowner on my block. Um and I guess the purpose of even asking about that would be to make sure that their preferences are adequately considered. On the other hand, I mean, there are communities where longtime residents are pitted against new homeowners, and maybe it's maybe it's better we just ask additional questions about outreach, whether people were okay with the virtual format, whether whether the number of in-person meetings we've had was sufficient without distinguishing between uh, um, residents who didn't get to vote on the survey and ones mm -hmm. who well <clears throat> our vote in favor of stu the study was so overwhelming i don't think uh, a few houses would make that much difference 
So I'm not sure that there's any value in uh, just singling them out. I have another question though, and that is, I'm just wondering if we might get a better response if we don't ask people how much they have, uh, like that first question, how much they have uh, spent time investigating and trying to become knowledgeable. <clears throat> Some people could get a little bit turned off by that um, or feel intimidated. You know, I didn't study it, therefore I can't have an opinion. Uh, and I'm not even sure it's that relevant because people will have feelings one way or the other, whether they studied it or not. So I, I would be in favor of not having that question. Okay. I would be inclined to agree with Keith. I think okay. there might be value in, if not for the pandemic, I, I wouldn't even feel a need to ask about outreach in the first place. But I do think some general questions that don't make people feel uh, unqualified may be helpful. Just general questions about participation or like, yes, uh, like whether they, there was adequate opportunity to. OK, to have questions answered rather than. Did you or did you not read all the materials? OK. I mean, I think I think another way to ask it to both of your points, Keith and David, is just to simply ask, are you aware? That this neighborhood is under. An HOD study. That might get that might if you if you feel compelled to ask any of those questions, I think that might previously aware, I guess, given. Well, obviously they'll be aware once they hit the ballot, but I think what we're asking is if they're. Well, what does that information provide us though? What if they say no? What are we going to do about it? Right. No, I mean, I'm just I guess I'm trying to I'm trying to reach out an olive branch to those who might say, well, hey, wait a minute. I just moved into this neighborhood last month and I'm not aware. Um, and it just maybe is an information, you know, gathering. But I, I, I understand Keith's point. <clears throat> excuse me um, about the fact that you know I think I don't remember the vote, but it was like seventy three percent. I don't think we've had you know in, in favor. I don't think we've had you know a twenty three percent or twenty seven percent um, turnover in the neighborhood since then. So um, I what guess. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, for the for the benefit of the the work group who may not be aware of this, the Holland Hills question, the Holland the Holland Hills survey was, I think, at the request of the supervisor. Whereas this request, uh, whereas this survey is at the request of the community, and so our our questions may be different from the supervisor who needs to know that they're faithfully representing their constituents. But I, I do think I do think we want questions that would benefit a supervisor, given that we've had a, a change in supervisor. I think also just again, in the spirit of everything we've done to date, I think we whatever questions lend themselves to transparency and information, I think are good. But again, keep in mind this ballot will be handed out after um, a community meeting, which we hope will be robust. So in many ways, I'd like to see a pretty strong focus on on making sure we reach as many people as possible to, um, you know, to attend the community meeting, even if it ends up having to be a, a split meeting, both in person and virtual. I just think we need to we need to cast as wide a canvas as possible for that. I think that's our best bet to be able to get people to to get focused on it and, um, you know, be able to ask questions about it and, and get comfortable with the topic. We will be doing a mailing uh, to announce the community meeting. Uh, I think it goes out two weeks before the meeting. So, um, it, and it will go to every property owner. What will about, that mean, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. To, will that no, mean, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna be quiet. No, um, will that mailing direct people to the HRA HOD site on the on you know on the county? Yes. Web? Okay. Yes. Yep. I think that's really important because I've I've tried really hard not to in the very beginning, but I've taken it down. I I actually would 
post the video links on our Homes Run Aikens website. It got too cumbersome because it means managing updates across multiple different platforms. And it's just not, it's just too easy for things to get lost or shuffled or outdated or whatever. So now it's, I'm just really pushing people towards the um, fairfaxcounty.gov for current, for current and ongoing work. And then to homesrunacres.com for historical and filed work. And I think that's still probably the best way to go. Yeah, and that's great. Whatever mailing you do, I think we should get a copy of it and put that up on our um, website and urge people to look out for it. Sure. No, absolutely. I mean, it won't be coming for a while. Well, I um, well, we only have a few more. Um, let's see. There has not been information posted in the agency. Okay, so I think that's for um, the Civic Association or or somebody else. Um, we only have a few more minutes, uh, and uh, I just want to uh, wrap up by um, talking about that second question about the ARB process. Um, I'm, I'll put it up again um, real quickly, just so we can just take a look at it and see if this is something, that, again, that you think is valuable to to have to include. So this is just the, there it is. So. So, you know, we'd have just what is your view of the ARB approval requirement for building per permit improvements within the proposed historic overlay district? And then it's again, it's a sliding scale on the bottom from negative to positive. Denise, are you asking whether we think this is a legitimate question or whether you want to include it in your poll? Yeah, no, I think that's, I, I would say that that, I mean, that sort of speaks to what it is, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's, I, I think we do need to have, I, I, I don't think the, I don't think the ballot can just be, you know, do you agree yes or no? I think, mm -hmm. I think it has to be based on everything you've heard. Is this something that you're, you know, in support of or not? So I think reiterating some of the basics are probably, it's probably a good idea. Okay, anybody else have? Thoughts about this? Okay, so I'm. I we we talked about the first question. Sorry, and I just wanted to hit on the second question because I'm assuming the third question is the one that that there's no. Uh, is, that's the one that you all definitely want an answer to. Um, are you in favor of moving forward? I mean, I think this one works too. It dawns on me, Denise, um, when we have our community meeting, it might generate a lot of questions. I'm hoping I'm hoping to to figure out a way to address the neighborhood to try to, and it's difficult to do because you know, to, to try to read up on this a little bit so that um, they can come to the community meeting with questions. Obviously, that would be the perfect world, and we have a Q and A session, and everybody gets a comfort level at that community meeting. But the reality of the way it's going to probably work is that people come with ideas or questions, they listen to the community meeting discussions, and that drums up more questions. Will there be a time lag between the end of the community meeting and the rollout of the ballot such that those questions have time to be addressed before people have to vote? Because I think that that's important. Sure. So the poll um, it is really up to you all uh, in the timing of the poll is really up to you all what we said the staff is recommending that the timing of the poll be after that community meeting just so everybody has that opportunity to hear the results of the study uh, hear the background and and you know etc um, I wouldn't want to do it before but you know the the poll is is really up to you um, yep. It's not required. It, you know, the, the, we're not required to do the poll. We're we're facilitating it for you. So, if you, you know, feel that there should be a, a a space between when the poll is rolled out and the community meeting, that would be entirely up to you. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah no, I absolutely has to happen after the community meeting, not before. And I absolutely would love for the county to do it, not us internally. I just think that gives that gives a bulletproof you know, transparency, um, ten, you know, yeah, uh, tone to it. But sure. it, I'm just based on other meetings that we've had. 
they tend to, it tends to get people talking and then they talk to their neighbors. And so people start to have more questions. And I would love all of that to be able to be vetted with people before they are requested to vote. So timeline wise, I don't know what that is. I think a lot of that depends on, um, I'm hoping that at the community meeting, somebody will be capturing questions that are asked that can't be answered in situ and that you know, then we say what a week or two or how long, however long it takes for heritage staff to get or EHT traceries to get back with answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. And also what format that would be, whether we once again direct people to the HRA HOD website and there'll be a posted q and I'm not sure how that all, I don't, I don't know logistically how that all works, but I think it has to happen prior to the ballot. Okay. That that's fair. So um, question we're never fully answered. Question for the prior community meeting. We're never from uh, the Holmes Run Acres prior community re meeting. So I let wish, me. I wish no HOD would identify him or herself because it's just not in the spirit of our neighborhood to be incognito. That and Art Mandalay as well. But yeah, I mean, I think we've. We've really tried hard, all of us, especially with questions. I mean, many of the questions we've posed in, certainly I have posed in meetings have been questions that I've gotten from people um, outside of the meetings that I've brought to the meetings. So I'm not sure with no HOD, I've asked no HOD and Art Vandalay to please reach out to me because I think that's more in keeping with the spirit of dialogue. <laughs> So and I, and I would actually um, second that if if there are specific questions that you have, please you know do do reach out to staff. We're happy to answer questions. We cannot answer specific questions about you know potential things that might happen to your prop the the specific things, but I can I can give you uh, good answers to generalities, and that's what we're trying to provide is just information. But you know we can't. Um, specific questions about what the Airbnb may or might may not approve. Um, I really can't that and that might be what we're what uh, the um, the community member is referring to. Um, so I, I do want to wrap up. We do have another one more meeting scheduled. I'm anticipating this might take two meetings and I'm thinking about planning an April meeting. I just want to put that on. Uh, you know your your mind. It would be again the third the third Wednesday, but um, I think we need to. This is just our, our introduction to the poll. Um, I think we need to to work through a little bit more of the um, structure in the questions. Um, if you all could come back with your your thoughts about what questions you want answered, it probably doesn't want you probably don't want too many questions. I would probably say no more than five. Um, but uh, I'm not even sure that that many is needed. But let's let's um, let's plan on talking about the poll on the at the March 16th meeting. I think that this um, meeting probably generated a lot of uh, questions for the community members. Um, my let's see, I am on the Holmes Run Acres Fairfax County webpage. My uh, email address is you can email me there. Um, and please do go to that web page because there's there is a ton of information um, in it's you know spend a um, an hour or two just going through it. So uh, Edith, hi. I just wanted to add, Denise, your name is and contact information is also on our homesrunacres.com website under the HRA HOD along with tons of other information. But your name is up there central. So I hope <laughs> great, I hope yeah. Get told on a lost dog, but your name is there. <laughs> Happy to answer any questions that that the community has. It might take me 24 hours to get back to you, but um, I will get back to you. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of follow up things I know, and uh, we'll see you on March 16th. Thanks, everybody. I have another question. Um, oh, yep. I meant to put it in the chat, but I think we were about to hang up. Okay. There are there are several parcels that don't have a house on them. So out parcels mm -hmm. uh, that have been added to someone's yard. Um, I assume that's a situation in Holland Hills too, and you've thought about how to how to handle that. Right. That's why I was proposing that we use one um, one vote per parcel uh, rather than per address, but that's really up to the community to decide. I think it's only three 
three property owners have an out parcel, it would not affect the results much. So whatever is more defensible as far as administering the 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 survey, I think we'd defer to you. Okay, great. All right, um, thanks again. And I look forward to uh, hearing your questions as they come in. I'm happy to respond. Thanks very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Edith. Really appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.